Welcome to the In the Silence podcast. I'm your host, Sandra Payne. As an RN and holistic wellness coach working with nurses, I'm uniquely positioned to hear the struggles, the deep passions, and the stories of nurses, our silent heroes. Many nurses suffer with burnout, depression, anxiety, PTSD, substance abuse, and suicidality, and they do so in silence. Nurses are the ones we turn to for help when we need it the most, and this is a heavy burden for them to carry. This burden, the pervasive bullying and unsupportive culture of our healthcare system means many nurses have lost their voice. These are their stories. My guest today is Kinnan Ross. Kinnan is a registered nurse who works as a clinical nurse leader in the Urban Health Program at St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver, BC. She graduated with her Bachelor of Science in Nursing in 2012 and was immediately drawn to the exceptional work being done at St. Paul's to support the most marginalized populations of Vancouver, in particular the harm reduction programs being developed and implemented for people who use drugs. In 2016, Kinnan's own lived experience with addiction made her incapable of carrying on her role as a nurse and led her to bravely surrendering her nursing license. After a year of intensive recovery, Kinnan returned to a primary care clinic at the hospital. However, the real work had just really begun. As she navigated her return to work and moved into her role as a clinical nurse leader on an inpatient unit dedicated to working with people in active addictions, Kinnan experienced a delayed traumatic psychological injury related to a violent incident at work where a co-worker was assaulted. This forced Kinnan to address her own unresolved traumas. Kinnan believes nursing has always been the driving force in her healing journey back to herself and credits her work with patients and colleagues for teaching her about her own place in this world. It is through working with patients that she has learned true empathy, self-compassion, and acceptance. Her hope is that through sharing her story, other nurses who are struggling with trauma and addiction can find a way to tell their stories and know that they don't need to suffer in silence. Kinnan, I am so happy to have you here. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks. I don't even think I need to say anything after that. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. It's so good to have you here. We would love to hear a little bit more about your story. So of course, where are you coming from with nursing? And you know, you can add in flavors of your personal life too. So we would just love to hear from you. Who is Kinnan Ross? Well, yeah, as you were saying, I am working as a clinical nurse leader on the urban health unit, which is actually an inpatient unit at St. Paul's. I've been in this position now since 2018. In my grade two descriptors, you know, your parents do those little yearbook things for you when you're a kid. In my grade two descriptor, it said I was going to be a nurse. And it's kind of funny because it took me a long time to get to be a nurse, but I eventually did start nursing school when I was 30 and started working at St. Paul's as soon as I graduated. So I'm a big believer in the human spirit and in our ability to support each other through pretty much anything. And I'm also a really big believer in saying our truths out loud and talking about our experiences in life. Because I think one of the greatest things that ever happened to me was when I realized that I wasn't the only drunk nurse in Canada. You know, like when I realized that I wasn't the only person that was suffering and that it was okay to talk about it and to sort of remove that cloak of shame. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a big believer in expressing and sharing what's happened to us and basically what's, you know, made us into the people that we are today. Yeah, thank you. I just love that saying the cloak of shame. I think it lifts it when we when we share our stories and we hear the connection and we hear we can resonate with other people and this whole idea of not being alone, which is really pervasive in in nursing from what I've learned from all the people that I have encountered, all the nurses, that there is this real sense that you're the only one that's struggling. I'm curious if you tell us a little bit more about the struggle that you had. I don't really remember life without a struggle. <laughs> I say that in like an emotional sense. I grew up with a wonderful family, you know, my mom and my dad, I can't even say enough good things about it. I mean, you know, we had a nice house and we always had food to eat and I always had, you know, whatever clothing I wanted. And, and you know, I was lucky enough to be able to attend a boarding school for most of high school. On the outside, everything in my life looked really, really, really great. And a lot of it was really great. And it's interesting because I, I think I experienced all of these really great things while simultaneously really suffering. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I struggled with 
self-esteem and body image and really intense bullying in elementary and junior high school. And I, I have just carried around this idea that I didn't matter and, you know, that I wasn't good enough. And I always felt that way. And I didn't know that it didn't have to be that way. So I had, you know, a couple of pretty significant events, some abuse that went on when I was really young. That is still sort of like part of what I'm working through today. And then as I was saying, there was like the extreme sort of mean girl stuff that I dealt with as a kid. And I can literally remember thinking when I would be like getting dressed in the morning, like if I put these jeans on, maybe they'll be nice to me today. Hmm. Or, you know, maybe they'll invite me to go to the movies with them on Friday. Or, you know, I just so desperately wanted to be included and liked and admired, if you will. Like I I just wanted people to think I was great. Mm -hmm. They made it very clear that they didn't think that. (laughs) I just sort of persevered and, you know, just like never gave up hope that someday people would be nice to me. And it's really awful for me to think about it now because no little kid should suffer like that and feel that excluded. And I, and I often wonder, you know, what my teachers saw and why nobody stepped in. It was really awful. Basically, the first time that I drank alcohol, I was pretty young. I was like 12. And I remember thinking, That was the first time that I ever felt okay. Like my inhibitions were gone and I didn't feel like people were judging me and I didn't feel like I had to try to fit in. Like I felt like I was funny and I felt like people liked me and I thought the boys liked me, you know, like it was like, I finally felt like a whole person. The first time that I got drunk, I threw up. I got grounded. I did like all of these, like my parents were just beside themselves. And I remember waking up the next morning and just thinking like, I can't wait to do that again. Like it was like the first time that I felt super okay in my body. And so I continued to drink like teenagers do. My group of girlfriends, as I got older, you know, we would like drink on the weekends or go to a party at somebody's house and drink. And I was always the person that was throwing up. I was always the person that was crying, so much crying when I would drink. I would just create these sort of like dramatic situations. And it actually became eventually the way for me to express my emotions was that You know, I spent so much time pretending I was okay that I would drink and then I would just, everything would come flooding out. So yeah, as I was saying, I was sent to boarding school starting in grade nine. And a lot of that was my parents were trying to get me away from, you know, these terrible bullies that I had been dealing with for most of my life. And going away to boarding school was truly a godsend. You know, I got to go to a place where nobody knew me. And I remember laying in my bed in the dorm that first night thinking like, wait a minute, None of these people think anything about me and kind of realizing that, you know, like I could start over, if you will. And I did well in high school and, you know, would come home for breaks and hang out with my friends and drink. And it really wasn't until I finished high school and came home and my family was living in just outside Edmonton at that point that I really started drinking regularly. I decided I wasn't going to university. I wanted to take time off. You know, I wanted like a gap year or whatever. And I started working in a restaurant and it was like every night of the week, there was a different bar. And so it was like the cheap drinks here and the cheap drinks there. I just thought this was normal. I didn't think that this was an abnormal thing. And eventually my parents convinced me to go back to university. And this was the first time that I started nursing school. I enrolled in a college in Edmonton. And I made it about three quarters of the way through my first year of nursing school before I realized that, you know, my grades were so bad, they were going to kick me out. I was just so into all of the other things going on at school, not necessarily the education part of it. (laughs) The school, like social weeks and the parties and the beer gardens and all of these things. And, you know, I had pretty much spent four years living in complete isolation in this small town where the sporting school was. So coming back to the city was like, do whatever you want. I withdrew from nursing school the first time that I attempted to do it and managed to finish a a BA. And I struggled through that, but I'm good at school. 
you know, and I learned very quickly what I could get away with and where I could cut corners and, you know, proceeded to basically drink and party my way through my Bachelor of Arts. And it was like a continual string of like long term boyfriends, and you know, just like being incredibly dependent on other people to make me feel good. And by the time I finished my BA, I had pretty much like burnt my life to the ground in Edmonton. I had, you know, hurt a lot of people and lied to a lot of people and I wasn't getting along with my family. So I decided that I was going to move to Vancouver and I did. So I got in my car and my dad and I drove out to Vancouver and I moved in with a friend of mine that I knew from Edmonton. I worked in the film industry for a couple of years, which was really cool. And my drinking was sort of like, it was okay at this point. I was definitely struggling with anxiety and depression in a big way, but I didn't know that that's what it was. I just thought that I didn't deserve to feel good. It was a pretty dark period, but I still had nursing school in the back of my mind. And eventually I applied for a college here and was told that I would have to wait a couple of years on a wait list. And so I did. Yeah, I just played hard, worked hard, was drinking and sort of did my thing. And I didn't really recognize that my drinking had become very patterned. The person that I was in a relationship with that at that time was also a heavy drinker. And so we sort of, you know, would co-sign each other's bad decisions. We, we drank a lot and it was pretty chaotic. And eventually, right before I was about to start nursing school, uh, that relationship ended it was a really dark period again, <laughs> but starting nursing school was like, like a rebirth for me because I knew that deep down inside, I wanted to help people. And I knew that I was good at helping people. I knew that I had a strong emotional connection to people around me and that I had this sort of intuition, which made it very easy for people to trust me and to feel safe with me. And as a nurse, I think that that's probably one of the greatest gifts that I have been able to bring to my professional job is that I can build relationships with people very quickly. I finished nursing school in December 2012 and I started working in January and I had done my preceptorship on a unit, the urban health unit. It started as an HIV program. Of course, there was a huge epidemic, uh, HIV epidemic in Vancouver. It's just such a neat place. And it's based in the same values that I have in my own life, you know, empathy, and consideration and acknowledgement of personhood and autonomy. And, you know, it's just a very different approach to nursing. And it's not that like regimented, scheduled, like really rigid kind of environment. And it's a place where I felt like I could be a really good nurse. I had to sort of pay my dues and work in a different program for the first two years. And I'll tell you what, that first two years of nursing practice was really tough for me. And I mean, I was completely traumatized by the workload that I was expected to take on. And, you know, the sort of lack of transition as a new graduate nurse. And what I do when I feel scared or overwhelmed is I shut down and I don't tell anybody. And I just make it look like I'm totally fine. And so the the way that that worked out for me as a new graduate nurse is that people thought I was really, really competent. And they did things like put me in charge, just put me into these leadership positions that I was in no way qualified to do. But I didn't know how to say no to people because I just wanted everybody to like me. That resulted in me just being super overwhelmed all the time. So during this period of time, I was definitely still drinking, but not daily. And I had kind of dabbled in some recreational drug use, like stimulant use, like throughout my early 20s and stuff, but it had never been a regular thing. It was somewhere in about probably late 2014, early 2015, that I really started to struggle with compassion fatigue. You know, moving in back into the urban health unit as a frontline worker, finally, as a frontline nurse, You know, feeling that sort of release from that chaotic medicine environment was great. Being able to spend that much more time with patients is the way that we get to hear people's stories. And and that is what I was really after. But it also made me more sort of privy to the horrific lives that some of them had led. And there's something really calming about hearing about somebody's trauma when you're a traumatized person. I don't mean that in it like, in a sadistic way at all. I mean it in like, 
I can understand that feeling and I can understand that emptiness and I can understand that isolation and that loneliness. And I was really struggling. You know, I didn't know how to say anything to anybody and I didn't really know what to do with it. So I just carried on, just continued to pretend like there was nothing wrong because at that point, that's what I'd been doing for 25 years. November, 2014, one of my uncles passed away. My dad's side of the family is, you know, there was five or six siblings and lots of cousins and we'd all been very close growing up. And this particular uncle was probably one of my most favorite people in the world. He was a university professor and and a performer and a pianist. And, you know, he was just wonderful. And he died very tragically. And it happened in Edmonton. My dad called me actually from his bedside at the emergency room as he was dying. It just, I crumbled after that. I could not cope with grief. I didn't, I didn't know how to do that. My only coping skill at this point in life was drinking. And then I actually started to use stimulants on a more regular basis. It was that whole thing where it was the only time that I could express my emotions was if I was drinking Then in addition, when I was using and the thing that was so great about stimulants for me was that it made it so that I could drink more. And I think that it's such a blur that period of time after my uncle Cameron died, and there was no real closure in the family, like he had sort of left everything in a bit of a disaster. And my dad and my aunt had to sort of sort out all of his affairs and his apartment. And it was really awful to be away from my family at that time. And and I didn't know how to grieve. So come March of 2015, I lost another uncle. And I hadn't really processed the first loss. In fact, we hadn't even had a funeral for him yet. And, you know, I'm working at the same time through all of this, doing my best to just sort of pour myself into my work and to be as effective and loving and caring as I could be with my patients, but I was completely incapable of doing that for myself. And so I was drinking and I was using and, you know, I started to use more. I started to sort of like break the rules that I had set for myself that I would never use the day before work, or I would never, you know, within 72 hours of a shift, I I wouldn't use drugs and I wouldn't drink. And by the end of 2015, I was in trouble. What I decided to do was to go and do ICU training because then I could work with patients who were intubated and I wouldn't, in my mind, I wouldn't have to hear their stories anymore. So I could just become a really technical, efficient nurse and I could save myself from, you know, having to to experience this trauma. And what I didn't realize was how traumatizing those two losses were and how that had just completely caused me to spiral. I was so angry. And when I entered critical care training in January, it took me away from the bedside. And the bedside had really been my anchor in all of my rules around my drinking and using. So it just was sort of a free for all after that. And it wasn't until the last week of critical care training when I was in clinical, and I was just exhausted by this point, you know, and I collapsed in the ICU on my last day of clinical and I was taken down to the emergency room and my blood sugar was really low and my blood pressure was really low and I was pale and skinny and just really not well. The resident said, you know, I think maybe you've got a urinary tract infection or, you know, maybe you're just exhausted and maybe you need to rest. They tried to do a urine test on me and I was just like, oh, absolutely not. (laughs) Because with all of the stimulant use, I had started to experience some paranoia. And yeah, it was actually about two weeks after that, that I was supposed to be starting in the ICU. And I did two orientation shifts. And then I just called in sick. I I knew that I couldn't do it. And I knew that I was jeopardizing, going to be jeopardizing people's health if I tried to practice in that state. And it was basically the moment where I just decided that I was going to take my own life because I didn't know how to articulate that I needed help. And I didn't know that I was experiencing extreme trauma. I didn't understand that. I just thought that I was bad at taking care of myself. I definitely knew that I was doing too many drugs, but I didn't 
consider my alcohol use to be a problem because it had just always been there. And I didn't really understand that that had been a lifelong coping mechanism. I think it was the second week of May, I called or I emailed the College of Nurses and just said that I wasn't fit to practice and that I needed to basically surrender my license and ask for some help with substance use. I think it was a long weekend. And it was like the Tuesday morning that I got this phone call from the lady at the college. And she was just like, you didn't go to work, did you? I was like, no, in fact, I didn't. And that was sort of the beginning of, you know, an entire year of recovery work and understanding that, you know, my recovery wasn't about that three years. It was actually about my whole life. (laughs) Mm-hmm. and that I had been struggling with some of these things for my whole life. I mean, there's so much there. I definitely want to get to, you know, your healing journey too. I just kind of want to frame some things that you've shared. And I wouldn't be surprised if there isn't listeners out there, because as you're sharing your story, I mean, I could see myself. I think a lot of women who grow up in, you know, fabulous homes with loving parents who are provided for, but yet, for some maybe mysterious, maybe known reason, have these deep-seated, awful darkness about them that is Mm -hmm. just desperate to fit in and desperate to be seen and to feel like you're important. And I mean, that, that desperation creates, you know, what I often call for myself anyways, is, you know, like a master chameleon, someone who can fit into any, any situation who can mold and put on the costume and the mask to fit and to, Mm -hmm. you know, to the outside world, no one would know that there's a problem because Mm -hmm. inside is where the problem is. and, And, you know, it's just ripping us apart. And this whole conversation around hiding your emotions and how the alcohol was a way for you to experience express, but also in a way to hide. It's like this double-edged sword that just actually helps so much when you're in that painful state. And, you know, it's sometimes it's alcohol for people. Sometimes it's food. Sometimes it's drugs. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's shopping. Sometimes it's, it could be so many different things, but we find these behaviors that, you know, they just, they numb, they numb it. And they also allow some form of release, but also sometimes a form of feeling. It's strange because it offers numbing and feeling, but yeah. But I definitely understand what you're saying there. It's like this simmering pot when we don't allow ourselves to feel what we're feeling. And if we, yeah. you know, if we've experienced trauma either directly or, you know, like secondary trauma, like so many nurses are exposed to by hearing these stories or witnessing these awful things, sitting with people in these dark, dark, dark moments, holding hands of people who are dying, hugging a mom yes. who's just lost her child. The, the impact that has on our heart is profound, but it's not really recognized that it's doing anything to us. So we couple that with these really heavy emotions at the surface I mean, it's a matter of time before it spills, right? It's it's yeah. just a matter of time before we can't navigate it anymore. I really honor you sharing your story so openly. And also the piece about where you felt like this was the end. This is where my life has to end because it can't, it can't go on like this. You know, such a hopeless place. I know that there are people listening because I, I've been there too. I've been in that hopeless place where it just doesn't feel like there's any other option. And I do believe that us sharing our stories and being truthful like this is going to help people who are in that place. Yeah. yeah. Because there is hope, right? I mean, there is hope. That's where I'd like to kind of take it is to ask you, what were some of the most helpful things that happened to you? Or what kind of triggered you to to seek the help that you needed? Because there is this sense of that it's a personal failing. It's something wrong with us. It's something that's, you know, it's it's never the system. It's never something outside of us. It's It's something deep that's wrong with us. And so yeah. to, to find your, to climb your way out of that hole and say, I need help. What was the ray of light that allowed you to be with us today? Well, it's really interesting because when you tell a college of nurses that you have an addiction, <laughs> they don't take that lightly. Basically, I, I was sent to a treatment center and then I was expected to follow what they called a relapse prevention contract for three years after that. And so the thing I think that's so interesting is that what I wanted was to be a nurse. That's what I wanted was to be able to go back to my job 
and to feel good about being a nurse again. And, you know, I never lost that drive to be helpful and be kind and be loving. And it's interesting because basically going into that recovery program, they weren't going to let me go and take care of other people until I could learn to take care of myself. And so I had to do a whole bunch of things. I had to do a 12-step program, and I had to check in with a monitor, and I had to do random urines, (laughs) and I had to, you know, basically prove that I wasn't going to be a danger to the public and that I wasn't using substances anymore. And so I did it. I literally just did, sometimes begrudgingly, but I did everything that they told me I had to do. You know, in that process, I went back to work and I went into a clinic because I couldn't go back to the ICU. I didn't remember most of my training Hmm. from the clinic. I was asked to apply for the leadership position, which I'm in now, which I never would have done if I hadn't gone into recovery. So it's funny, right? How all I wanted to do was get back to where I was, but I ended up somewhere completely different. You know, it's like what I'm hearing from you is that actually being a nurse was the saving grace. It was, you know, you had such a passion for doing that kind of work. And these parts of you, you know, the compassion and the love and the the caring and the empathy. I mean, those are pieces of you that you have carried your entire life and that we all do. Actually, when you saw your your ability not to nurse, it was like the tipping point, like the, you know, if you want to call it the rock bottom kind of is what I'm hearing from you anyhow. And the desire to go back to that was what allowed you to move through all of these, you know, grueling. I mean, anybody who thinks that healing is pretty has never healed. <laughs> so yep. uh, it's, you know, it's not unicorns and rainbows. It is deep, oh, no. dark, dark shit. And it is, yeah. you know, it is really messy, mucky tunnels to wade through and navigate. And sounds to me like you did a lot of that in the, in the treatment center. I mean, a 12 step program, it's pretty intense. So tell us a little bit about like, what have been the most helpful tools or resources that you've found that have really helped to kind of bring you to where you are today? Because I went from being somebody who didn't talk at all to being an (laughs) oversharer, you know, and I think just like learning to be comfortable with my own story. So, you know, a lot of counseling, a lot of sort of inner work. And, you know, the biggest thing I think was having people say to me, that's not true. What you're telling us isn't true. Because I had spent so many years pretending that everything was okay to have somebody say to me, like, if that was true, you wouldn't have ended up in a treatment center. If that was true, you wouldn't have been, you know, abusing drugs and alcohol. It was like the first time in my life that somebody ever called me on it. Learning to be honest was a big thing for me. My family, like my partner and my friends are the reason that I'm here at all. And also learning to be comfortable in my own skin. So meditation, yoga, even just like nature walking and sitting still. Those things were all so hard for me. Learning how to do those things has actually been probably the the most rewarding, but one of the hardest things for me too. It's especially going into like another, a a leadership position where again, I got kind of imposter syndrome-y, you know, was really afraid that I was doing it wrong, (laughs) was hard, but it was almost as if the universe just like only gave me what I could handle. It was all going really, really, really well until my friend was assaulted and That's when I went off the rails completely. (laughs) That was sort of part two of healing. And that's still something that I'm working on to this day. And that was the situation where it was recommended that I reach out to that other mutual friend of ours. And I kind of feel like I never would have gotten to this place if I hadn't done the first part of all of that work. If I hadn't gone to treatment, if I hadn't learned all of those things I was just talking about. There's no way that I would have been able to make it through this traumatic injury that I had, the psychological injury. It just wouldn't have happened. You know, like it would have, it would have ruined me. It's like healing in layers, right? Yeah. Totally. You learn how to do one thing and then the next thing comes along and you're like, oh shit, here we go again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, here we go again, but it's like with a different 
lens. That's what I yeah. feel anyways, in my own journey, but also, you know, what I witness in others is, you know, the more we do this work and the more we learn to be comfortable with ourselves and to really reestablish that deep connection with ourselves, which is what all of those tools are doing, right? Like, you know, when you can sit yeah. still and listen to yourself and to climb back into your body and to learn to talk nicely to yourself and to do nice things for yourself and yoga and meditation. And I mean, your truth that is like, you know, the only path to freedom from all of these, you know, chains of trauma is honesty is like taking those hard looks in the mirror and really owning what's going on and how you're feeling. I mean, it just takes such courage to do this kind of work. And I I agree with you. I think we are given the next layer when we're ready for it. But those initial layers, it doesn't mean that they're any easier or harder than what's coming, but we become more equipped right? So as you learn and you experience these different new ways of being, you're more equipped to deal with that deeper work. If we started on the deeper stuff, none of us would make it through, you know, we would need a massive team of support, which ultimately, I think we all need anyways, but to help pull us through something like that. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it was like the morning that I went into work, and I found out that my like my mentor was assaulted by a patient the night before. And I just remember immediately feeling like it was my fault. I mean, there was absolutely nothing that I could have done to prevent that. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Like I wasn't even in the building, you know, but I felt that because I was the leader that I should have seen it coming. Mm -hmm. It caused a lot of trauma in our workplace, not just for me, but for our whole program, you know? And I think I really took it as like a slight against me that, you know, I had done something wrong and that everybody thought I was terrible at my job. You know, what it did is it completely unearthed all of the trauma from the bullying, from the mean girl stuff. I I thought people were talking about me. I got paranoid. I, I completely dissociated. Like I don't remember huge periods of time from September until Christmas. It was awful. You know, like every day, I was in fight or flight at work every day. I constantly felt like I was, you know, something terrible was going to happen. And it was a tough time, you know, like there was all sorts of safety committees and WorkSafe was involved and there was investigations and it's automatic for people to assume that somebody who could hurt a nurse is, has got to be out of their mind, intoxicated, or that must be one of those bad drug users. And part of the problem with being somebody in recovery is that I have an identity inside of me as a bad drug user. And so when people started talking about our patients in a negative way, the sort of like stigma and stereotypes that people have around people who use drugs, they're out of their minds and they're psychotic and they can't take care of themselves and they're dangerous and they're violent. That all hit me like they were talking about me. It just was this horrific, horrific place where all of the shame that I felt around my drinking and using, it felt like it was all being publicized, Mm. that that people thought that about our patients and they thought that about me. There was one thing that was said that just really stuck with me, which was that I wasn't approachable. And I literally crumbled. Like by Christmas, I had two weeks off at Christmas and I slept for the whole two weeks. And then I went back to work and two weeks later, I went on vacation. And when I got back from that trip, I didn't even make it through two days of work. And I knew that I was in trouble. I couldn't stop crying. I thought everybody was out to get me. I yelled at my my direct supervisor in front of our director. And he just kind of looked at me and said, are you okay? And I said, no, I'm not okay. Mm. And it was in that moment where I actually said, that out loud that I realized that I had once again been hiding all of the things that I was really feeling. Yeah. And it was because I saw myself as a leader and that it was my job to sort of make sure everybody else was okay and that my feelings around the situation didn't matter. Mm -hmm. When in fact, it was, you know, somebody really close to me that was hurt. It was so hard to figure out which part of me was the leader and which part of me was, you know, the traumatized nurse. It was, it was just such a difficult time. And then the stigma of having a trauma response, because I didn't act very well (laughs) through that whole process. Right. But I refused to acknowledge that there was anything wrong. Yeah. 
but I just want to frame too. I mean, what you're telling me is that for years, years of your life, you pretended like everything was okay, even though inside it was not, but you had this pivotal moment where somebody asked you if you were okay and you owned it and you were like, no, I'm not. I'm curious what happened after that, because I, I feel like those are like really really big doorways when we admit that we need help or we admit that we're not okay. So what kind of transpired after you said, I'm not okay? I said, I think I'm going to go to the doctor tomorrow. And I went to the doctor and, you know, I just said, I'm not okay. And I described everything that was happening. And she said, you know, I think you need to take some time off. And she said, I'm going to, I'm going to write you a note to, to keep you off for two weeks. And I want you to come back in two weeks and we'll see how you're doing. She increased one of my medications and, you know, I promised I would go to counseling. And this was also right when the pandemic was starting. Mm -hmm. So the beginning of March, 2020 is when I went on leave. But it was about three weeks later that I realized that this was actually a workplace injury, that it wasn't because I was bad and I couldn't take care of myself and I wasn't strong enough, but that I actually had experienced experienced a traumatic injury. And so I filed a work safe claim. And with that comes, you know, a psychological evaluation. That was when I reached out to our mutual friend. That was when I started to realize that I had literally been in trauma mode for almost a year. Mm -hmm. It was unbelievable. During this period of time is when the BC government had passed legislation that we didn't have to prove that PTSD came from work. Basically, it was like automatic coverage by WorkSafe. I had an evaluation with a psychologist over Zoom and waiting for that report to come back was so painful because it was like waiting for somebody to validate me in like a medical way. Mm -hmm. And basically, she came back and said that she didn't think I had PTSD. I definitely had a secondary stress injury but not PTSD. WorkSafe agreed that I had a WorkSafe claim. They provided me with an occupational therapist and a counselor. I worked with those two professionals for five months and did a gradual return to work in September of 2020. So yeah, not even a year. Mm -hmm. I have to imagine that There's been some real highlights in your career as well. And I mean, for sure, one that we've already talked about is like taking on this leadership role, even though it came with a whole lot of confrontation in your healing journey, which actually, you know, when I say that out loud, it makes me feel like probably meant to be right. You know, I think that we're given these sort of opportunities and gifts to allow us to reveal and to deal with another layer of what is going to show up, you know, taking on a leadership role for sure. Like what you said, like the imposter syndrome and, you know, taking on a whole lot more responsibility. It was just like a really profound way to confront those deep wounds that you had around the bullying that you experienced as a child and being liked and being good enough. Something has kept you coming back to nursing. You know, a lot of people comment and say like, it's the patients, right? And so I'm curious for you, what's what's kept your heart in this job going through everything that you have laid out for us? Nursing is a passion, 100%. Being able to care for people in active addiction as a person with lived experience in active addiction is the biggest reward. It actually makes recovery so much more meaningful for me to be able to look at people who I can understand some of what they're dealing with and say, don't give up. Don't give up. If you want to get through this, you know, don't give up. I had a patient show up who was so sick and, you know, was, was really struggling with addiction. And, and I made a passing comment to this patient on my way out the door one day. And I basically said, don't trip on the finish line. You know, you're so close to getting to where you've been working to get to. And that patient reached out to me a year later and said, Hey, I just wanted you to know that I've been in recovery for a year now. And it was just this passing comment that I made to a patient, but a patient that I had talked to about some of my experiences and knowing that my struggle meant something, that my story meant something, that me being open and vulnerable was safe. 
that it wasn't something that was going to be made fun of or used against me or used to stigmatize me or to judge me. It was something that actually really, really, really inspired somebody else. Mm -hmm. That person is now working in a peer role. Like they're working as a person in recovery with other people who are hospitalized. And I just think that person gave me so much hope. And, you know, just like hearing that the changes that I talked about helped somebody else make changes. And the changes that that person's going to talk about with other patients could help somebody else make changes. And, you know, I think that's truly how we recover, right? Is that we see somebody else doing what we think is impossible. And we see somebody else in these positions, you know, that person looking at me as a nurse and me looking at other women in recovery and thinking, I can never be like that. But here I am. And I am like that. Mm -hmm. It's this, if if she can do it, maybe I can too. You know, when we share, and this will just tie right back to one of the first things you said is about sharing your truth. When we step up and, you know, in that vulnerable place and share our truth and it clicks with somebody and somebody sees pieces of themselves in, in someone else that's sharing their truth. It is so inspiring. And it does bring this huge wave of hope over that person because it does, it creates this, if she can do it, maybe I can too. Yeah. And I just, I mean, I feel the power in that. And I a thousand percent why this podcast exists is so that people can hear the truth and they can know that they're not alone. They can know that there's hope. They can know that there's another way and that they don't have to be stuck in the pain and the struggle that maybe is their reality right now. You know, again, I really just honor you for your truth because it's mm-hmm. so brave to to step up to the mic and share. I want to just give you a chance to share anything else that you'd like to share with everyone that's listening. I think the only other piece of this that has literally become one of my goals in life is to normalize substance use. People would say, but you're a nurse. You can't be addicted to things. And it's like, wait a minute, though. (laughs) Yeah, I can. Mm -hmm. I think that one of my goals is to be open about being in recovery from addiction and to be open about being in recovery from trauma because these things happen to everyone. Lawyers, doctors, Safeway workers, pharmacists, nurses, everyone has these vulnerabilities. I just think it's so important that we talk about it because just stigma around people who use drugs and people who have mental health is so limiting and it's so destructive. I just would really encourage everyone to challenge their understanding of people who use drugs. People who use drugs are people. And a lot of the time, they're people who have experienced really terrible things. They don't need anything but love from the rest of us, you know, and they need empathy and they need support and they need particularly for nurses and doctors to treat them with compassion. And I think that that's my big soapbox. Addiction doesn't discriminate (laughs) and we need to do better caring for people who use drugs because some of those people who use drugs are our colleagues. And I think that that's where, you know, we get to be in a place where we can say, hey, I need help. This isn't working for me anymore. Or, you know, I'm feeling very unsure about my alcohol use because it's so normalized. Sometimes it's not normal, right? It's something we all need to talk more about. Yeah, I think it ties in so closely with uh, the stigma that's carried around any kind of mental and yeah. emotional struggle. And, you know, the, the less we talk about it, which I will, you know, be the first one to step up and say it has definitely gotten better over the years. The stigma that existed when I was back in my teenage years and my 20s, is, it's not the same as it is today, but it still exists. Mm-hmm. And it's even yeah. more so in the helping professions because we are held to a higher standard. We are made to feel like we somehow are superhuman or we're supposed to be. So the stigma around struggling when you're supposed to be, you know, this pillar of strength, it's very hard to step up and, and admit that you're struggling and that you need help and that, yeah. you have, that you have a problem when we are up against such a, an unrealistic expectation of us. And I think, you know, what you said, like, it doesn't discriminate. It it could be your coworker. It could be a family member. We just don't know. We don't know what demons people are dealing with. 
I think we need to show up in every way, you know, with our patients and our, and our colleagues and our families and everyone with this compassion and this understanding that we don't know what people's lives consist of. We don't know what kind of trauma they've experienced or what kind of pain they're going through. That kind of compassion and that deep connection with another person, just being able to see them and to accept them for where they're at. I just, you know, I feel like that would be such a, a huge shift in, well, not just our patient care, but in, in the culture of nursing, right? If we could just have this openness and this acceptance and create a culture where it's okay to talk about our problems that we're not expected to be superhuman. Yeah. It's, it's not real. And it just, yes, this makes us suffer in silence until well, we can't exactly. anymore. Yeah. Exactly. You know, it's so interesting because I think one of the things that I say, I mean, I am a harm reduction nurse through and through and through, you know, and I love the work that I do. And I see it as such a privilege to be able to be with people and listen to them and love on them and, you know, help them get the care that they need. But one of the things that I say to people when they sort of scoff at, well, that person just, they're going AMA and they, they just think drugs are more important. And it's like, no, they're in pain. And when I say that, I don't necessarily mean physical pain. I mean, emotional pain. Sometimes people get it and sometimes people don't. Yeah. Eventually people will make up their minds and they're going to think what they're going to think. But if you give me the opportunity to talk to you about people who use drugs, I'm going to do it <laughs> because I believe so strongly in in people and without people I wouldn't be okay mm -hmm. yeah and nurses in particular you know we we need to show each other a little more compassion and be a little bit more gentle with each other I think thank you for all of this I mean such a powerful story that you have you know struggle to recovery and some really profound deep truths that I know people that are listening will hear because you know if anyone has experience these dark feelings of, you know, self-loathing and like, you're not good enough. And like, you're a failure. If anyone has even had a glimpse of those, which I would probably wager a bet that a good, nearly a hundred percent of any oh, yeah. woman listening yeah. has experienced yeah. to some degree, you know, they're going to hear a little bit of themselves in that. Mm -hmm. And how many people listening who have used drugs or have excessively yeah. used, used alcohol to try to cope with the extreme emotional discomfort and pain that we can feel. And it's so, you know, it's just such a humbling place to be on the other side when you realize how important it is for people to just be allowed to be real to be allowed to be authentic, no matter what that looks like, even if it's messy and emotional, that, mm -hmm. that when we allow space for that, it's that's where healing and growth can happen. Yes. But if but if we just keep shutting it down, and you know, sort of cultivating this stigma that exists, it's, it's never going to be a safe place for us to heal. And we have to heal if we're going to make it through. I just again, I really want to thank you for being here with me today and for sharing your story. And you know, all of it, your, your insights and your wisdom and your inspiration of hope for anyone mm -hmm. and everyone out there. So thank yeah. you. No, thank you so much for having me. And I'm so glad that, that we were able to, to chat and mm -hmm. I'm really, really grateful for, you know, the work you're doing. And I think you're a person with lived experience as a nurse helping other nurses. Mm -hmm. It's such a great way to be able to honor each other to, you know, have a platform where nurses can come and talk about being a nurse and talk about being a nurse, not in the care that we're giving, but in the things that we experience. Yeah. The truth. So, yeah. The truth. The truth. It, right. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. I personally want to thank you for taking your time to listen to this podcast. It is my truest honor to sit with these nurses and witness them tell parts of their story. We as human beings have a deep need to be seen and heard, and this is my way of helping nurses in particular find their voice. Please know that the opinions shared in this podcast are those of the individuals sharing them and not a reflection of any employer or regulatory body. We are sharing our truth, and that may not always resonate with you, but I'm guessing if you're listening that something has rung true for you in this podcast. Our stories offer healing and create connection two things that we as nurses need as we navigate the jungle of a healthcare career. So thank you for being witness. And if you feel inclined to reach out to the guest on today's episode to offer validation and appreciation, you can always find their contact in the show notes, as well as other links to the offerings of Sandra Payne Wellness. 
If you'd like to be a part of the community, join our private Facebook group, Surviving Nursing. And if you'd like to share your story on the End the Silence podcast, be sure to reach out. When we can come out of the shadows and into our light, we can create the change that is needed. And when we do this work together, we are so much stronger. Thank you for listening.